Alright, this is Jahangir from Edporium, and today we're back with part 2 of genetics and cellular function. In part 2, we'll discuss protein synthesis, including transcription and translation. Alright, so we're first going to talk about protein synthesis. Now, to start, we need to define what protein synthesis is. And as the definition says, it's just the synthesis of protein, or the production or development of protein through the actions of transcription and translation. So we can think of protein synthesis as just the whole factory that hosts the action of transcription and translation, which we'll talk about later. So to continue talking about protein synthesis, we need to talk about genes. And as I talked about in the first part, genes are just a segment of DNA that code for a specific protein. Now, most cells have an identical set of genes. So what does that mean? So let's just say this is one of these cells, one of their uh, DNA. And this will represent our cabinet. Now, our cabinet will have a lot of information, which will be our genes. And an, an employee, let's just say this is an employee, there will be a lot of files in that cabinet, but he won't use all those files. And his other employee will have the same amount of files, the same identical files, but he won't use the same files as his fellow employee. That's what's seen in these cells. So as I talked about before, the liver cells use their information for synthesizing or the functions of the liver, while the brain uses its information for the functions of the brain. So at this point in time, you might be wondering, why are genes relevant to protein synthesis? Well, when a gene is activated or when it is taken out by the employee, the DNA will make an identical version of that DNA, which will be our messenger RNA, or also known as our mRNA and that mRNA creates a specific protein which we'll talk about. So to start we need to talk about transcription. Alright, so let's talk about transcription. And this is a process in which our RNA polymerase, it's just a type of enzyme, creates a mirror image of genetic information from the DNA. And this mirror image will become our mRNA. So let's look at this picture down below. The purple structure represents our RNA polymerase. Now this blue and red line represents our DNA, just coiled around. Now our RNA polymerase will act as a zipper, unwinding the double helix to expose the nucleotides, specifically our nitrogenous bases. So, so in transcription, we will have these free nucleotides. So here's what our free nucleotides would look like. So those free nucleotides will code for a specific strand of that DNA which was opened up by our RNA polymerase. So here's what that would look like. These would represent our nitrogenous bases and each of them match together. For example, adenine would bind with specifically uracil since we're talking we're trying to make a RNA and cytosine would bind with guanine and thymine would bind with adenine. Now when each of these nucleotides bind together, they form this long strand which represents our RNA, specifically our messenger RNA. Now the RNA polymerase will go throughout the double helix, unwinding it, adding up to the buildup of this mRNA with the free nucleotides that are adding onto the nitrogenous base and this process continues, which shows transcription. All right, so now let's talk about translation. This is when our messenger RNA is converted to create an amino acid, which creates our protein. So translation, you could think of it as translating that mRNA to that protein. Now there are three different structures that constitute for the process of translation. The first one obviously is our messenger RNA, which as I talked about, will be converted to create a specific protein. Now the second one is known as our transfer RNA or tRNA which is a small RNA that binds the amino acids from the cytosol and helps code for the specific RNA. It takes that specific amino acid to code for a specific anticodon in our ribosome which we'll talk about later. To memorize the tRNA in a simple way you could think about it as just a small RNA that binds a amino acid. So what does a tRNA look like? So Here's what a 2D version of the tRNA looks like. We'll see a 3D version later. So we have our attachment of protein or our site of protein in which protein attaches. Now our second structure is known as our anticodon. 
Now our anti-codon will attach to a specific part of the codon from the mRNA. So let's just say we have adenine, uracil, and guanine. Well, the anti-codon over here would be uracil, adenine, and cytosine. So that's what an anti-codon is. You can think of it as the attachment site. All right, so now let's talk about our third and final structure responsible for translation, and that includes the ribosome. Now, the ribosome is just a small reading machine found in the cytosol. It's the one that codes throughout the whole mRNA and makes that specific protein. So there are two subunits of an active ribosome in translation. First, we have our small unit and we have our large unit. Now, both of these fuse together in translation to code for our RNA. Now, in our ribosome, we have three different binding sites for our transfer RNA. The first one includes our a site. Now, the A site will be the first site in which our tRNA will attach to. The second one is called the P site, and the P site is the second site in which the tRNA binds to. Now, the third binding site is known as our E site. The E site, as I talked about, is the final binding site on the ribosome. So this is how it goes in order. The tRNA will go through the A site, then the P site, then the E site. We'll see this later. All right, so what does translation look like in action? So we're first gonna talk about the first process of translation. This is called initiation. This is when our mRNA is already produced and it goes through the pores of the nucleus. When it does, it coils around and makes this sort of loop in which our subunits are different subunits. We have our large subunit right here and our small subunit right here. They bind together to form an active ribosome, which goes around the mRNA, just reading all throughout the mRNA and all the codes. It first goes to the start codon, which is usually AUG. So now we have a second stage of translation, or the second process, and that is known as elongation. So we zoom into the ribosome, and this is what we see. Now, this starts by the initiator tRNA, and, and unfortunately, this picture does not show the initiator tRNA. So, you may be wondering, what is the initiator tRNA? Well, this is basically the start tRNA, and it usually adheres to the P site, where the whole ribosome uh, attaches to the start codon, the AUG. When that does happen, our, T, our tRNA, our initiator tRNA, goes to the P site and carries methionine, or also known as MET. So let's just say this is our tRN, this is our initiated tRNA, it's really not, but let's just say it is, and it attaches to the P site. Well, that's great. Now we have the tRNA, and this is just a random tRNA, and it'll go through the pool of amino acids. Now, as we talked about through the anatomy, they have a site in which they attach the protein, but they sacrifice an ATP molecule. And they take that, they go through to the A site. Now, when this, ha when this, when this does happen, the new tRNA will replace our initiator RNA, our initiator tRNA, and the initiator tRNA will move to the E site in which they just leave, they're pushed out. So here's what our new tRNA looks like. It has a methionine and another and, and another amino acid that is specific for this specific codon. So that process continues. A new tRNA gets a uh, another amino acid and just goes to the A site, pushes that, uh, that old tRNA that we talked about and that old tRNA goes to the E site and that process continues and continues until there is a buildup of amino acids which form the strand of protein as we all know. Now we're at a third stage of translation. This is known as termination. And this is when our ribosome contacts a stop codon. When, the, when this does happen, there is a release factor that adheres to the A site instead of another tRNA. And when this happens, the free the protein is taken off of that ribosome and the ribosome usually splits off. But since those two subunits are close to the RNA, they just bind together and they go through 
through this whole process again. So now we have come upon our fourth and final stage of translation. This is known as packaging and exporting exportation of protein. And this is when our free protein docks the rough endoplasmic reticulum. When it does, there are enzymes that fold this whole protein to fit in a transport vesicle, which is taken out to the Golgi complex and the Golgi complex usually um, puts lip lipids in there and then sends it out out of the cell. So now let's just review all of protein synthesis and we start by DNA and our RNA polymerase will create a mirror image of that DNA which is known as our messenger RNA. Now when this happens our messenger RNA is converted into a specific protein as our final product for protein synthesis and this protein will use will be used throughout our body. So let's name the two different processes we talked about throughout this video. So from DNA to mRNA, it's known as transcription, and I'll just abbreviate, abbreviate. And from mRNA to protein, it is known as translation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up part two of genetics and cellular function. In part two, we discuss protein synthesis and its two processes, including transcription and translation. And as always, a Pomodoro day will make you doctor someday. I'll see you next time.